Welcome, friends. Uh, warm greetings from CNS and the Union. The Universal Health Coverage Day is today, and uh, as we all know, that uh, you, know, you know, human right to health is so important, and it is uh, it must be protected and fully realized. These commitments are also part of the promises governments have made in the UN Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. And uh, let us hear from a panel of experts. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator. Ashok Ramsarup is a widely acclaimed international award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa, with over 40 years of rich experience in journalism. Uh, a year before, he received uh, an international award from the granddaughter of Mahatma Gandhi, who is herself a Gandhian and, uh, and led anti-apartheid struggle. He is, was the senior producer at South African Broadcasting Corporation, or SABC. Over to you, Ashok Bhai. Greetings from Durban, South Africa. Governments have committed to achieve universal UHC by 2030 by adopting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, earlier this year. At the 70th World Health Assembly, governments and other partners reinforced the promise to work together with renewed urgency to achieve the universal health coverage by 2030. UHC means everyone can access the quality health services they need without financial hardship. Today, on Universal Health Coverage Day, 12 December, let us listen and interact with experts on how will UHC accelerate progress towards not only ending TB, but also averting premature deaths from non-communicable diseases, NCDs. Targets for hashtag MTB and hashtag beat NCDs are enshrined in the sustainable development goals as well. We will hear more from our distinguished panel of experts. Dr. Kerry Vinnie, Sydney Sachs Postdoctoral Research Fellow, Department of Public Health Sciences, PHS, Karolinska Institute, Stockholm, Sweden. And she also chairs Australasian TB Forum, Ms. Ginny Williams. She ran the International Council of Nurses TB project from 2008 to 2014 and subsequently worked with ICN on finalizing the second edition of the Best Practice Guide. Ms. Williams has been active in the field of TB since 1993 and worked as a TB nurse specialist herself in London for five years. She joined the Nurses and Allied Professional Section of the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, the Union, in 1994, and was chair from 2001 to 2002. She chaired TB Alerts Advisory Board from 1999 to 2002, and was a trustee from 2002 until 2006. In 2003, she was seconded to head the newly formed nursing division of the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Diseases, the Union. Ms. William is currently training to be an ordained Anglican priest, but continues to do a small amount of consultancy with TB Alert, a British-based charity committed to tackling TB in the United Kingdom and developing world. Dr. Rajesh Sood, District Program Officer at the National Health Mission, Department of Health and Family Welfare, Government of Himanchal, Pradesh, India. Before we listen to our first panel panelists today, let me request you all to keep sending us your question either by using the chat function or raising virtual hand of the webinar tool. Keep sending the questions while our panelists present. Well, now let's listen in. It's over to Dr. Kerry Vinnie. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. And I'm very pleased to be speaking at this forum today on Universal Health Coverage Day. Uh, we'll just check if we can show my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yeah, I'll just get, try and get this to work and get the slideshow going. 
So yeah, thank, thank you very much for the really kind introduction and thank you for asking me to speak here. We'll just try and get this working so that you can see the whole slide there, which great. Okay, I think that's working. Um, and I'm really pleased to be speaking at this session on universal health coverage and very pleased to be speaking with Miss Jenny Williams, who I worked with um, over 10 years ago in London when I also worked as a TB nurse. I'm really honoured to be speaking with Jenny and also with Dr. Sood. Um, so I'm just going to start with a bit of an overview of universal health coverage and to try and set up the scene for the uh, subsequent speakers. And obviously today we're talking on will universal health coverage accelerate progression to NTB and beat NCDs. I'm going to focus on TB a little bit, partly because that's where I've been working in the last few years, but I think many of these principles will also apply to NCDs. So firstly, I guess happy UHC Day. Um, as mentioned, today is Universal Health Coverage Day, the 12th of December. And it's really the day that we celebrate the resolution adopted by the UN General Assembly in December 2012 to promote access to affordable, high quality healthcare services. And this resolution really, when you read the resolution, it urges governments to move towards providing all people with access to affordable, quality healthcare services. And it recognises sort of the vital role of health in achieving international development goals, so health having a central role in development. It reaffirms the World Health Organization's leading role in supporting countries to respond to the challenges when they're implementing universal health coverage and when they're expanding access to universal health coverage. And it emphasises health importantly as a precondition, also an outcome and an indicator of all three dimensions of sustainable development. So those three dimensions are economic, social and environmental. And it calls on uh, the member states to adopt not just a health-based approach to universal health coverage, but a multi-sectoral approach. Now, um, universal health coverage was sort of partly enshrined in this World Health Report in 2010, um, Health Systems Financing, the Path to Universal Coverage. But of course, the concept we've been talking about, sort of um, health for all, uh, Alma Ata, those kind of things for a long time. But this report really repackaged it as universal health coverage. Since that report, there have been a number of declarations and statements about uni health, universal health coverage specifically, including the Bangkok Statement on Universal Health Coverage, the Mexico City Political Declaration on Universal Health Coverage, and the Tunis Declaration on Value for Money, Sustainability and Accountability in the Health Sector, all adopted in 2012. So to set us up for this next hour, the, the definition of universal health coverage is the situation where all people and communities receive the quality services that they need and are protected from health threats without suffering financial hardship. And this really uh, embodies three related objectives or principles. So you can see them here on the slide. And the first one is equity. So equity in access to health services so that the people who need the health services should be able to access them, not just people who can afford to pay for them or who can access them by proximity or by other means. The second objective or the second principle is that the quality of health services should be good enough to improve the health of those people receiving those services. So there's no point in having equitable access if when people access those services, the quality is poor. The third objective or principle is a very important one and one that I'm going to pick up on in the next few minutes is that people should be protected against financial risk. So they should be able to access the healthcare services that they need of high quality without putting them at risk of financial harm. So moving on to TB, that's universal health coverage, moving on to TB. I think many of us um, on the call and many of us know about the end TB strategy, this big global strategic plan to see the world free from TB. And you can see there that the visit vision is exactly that, a world free of TB, a very bold, ambitious statement. Uh, and there's also another bold, ambitious goal, which is ending the global TB epidemic. And you can see in this panel here, in this slide, that there are um, fairly ambitious milestones and targets to achieve which are aligned to the Sustainable Development Goals. So for example, a reduction in the number of TB deaths 
by of 95% compared to 2015, a reduction in TB incidence of 90% compared to 2015, and that no uh, TB affected families will face catastrophic costs due to TB. And this is perhaps an indicator that aligns a bit more closely with the concept of universal health coverage. So, of course, um, the NTB strategy, as I just mentioned, aligns to the Sustainable Development Goals and is epitomised in Goal 3, which is good health and wellbeing. And we have a target within that goal, Target 3.3, to end the global TB epidemic. But I think many of us would argue that TB is acutely affected by many of these other goals. So, um, for example, Goal 1, no poverty. Goal 2, which is about zero hunger and malnutrition. TB will be affected by those. And no doubt, if we looked across this panel of the Sustainable Development Goals, we could say that TB might be affected by Goal 4, quality education, Goal 8, decent work and economic growth, Goal 10, reduced inequalities, and maybe even more of those Sustainable Development Goals. So it's in that context that we need to think about universal health coverage. So thinking a little bit more about ending the TB epidemic, and we're talking about ending TB today, uh, and what the NTB strategy says about that, I think it's quite clear that uh, the NTB strategy says that for us to end the TB epidemic, it requires implementation of a mix of interventions. So you can see that we need biomedical interventions, perhaps, public health interventions, socioeconomic interventions, underpinned by research and innovation. And progress in ending the TB epidemic will really depend on, at least in WHO's view, depend on some of these things. So firstly, optimising the current strategies and interventions that we have for both TB care but also prevention. And number two, I think importantly for this talk, is achieving universal access to TB care and support within the context of universal health coverage. But also not just that, thinking about social protection, addressing the social determinants of TB and perhaps the social determinants of health and poverty more broadly, and thinking about TB more broadly in a global development framework of poverty uh, reduction and addressing inequities in our societies. And then thirdly, investing in research to develop new, better and rights-based tools and strategies for diagnosis, treatment and prevention of TB. And I would argue that we need research not just to develop these tools, but to think about how they're applied in country settings and how they're applied in different contexts and how they can be applied in the context of universal health coverage so that people get access to the tools that they need for their health care and in particular for TB. So uh, many of you will know about the, this is just another slide about the NTB strategy. It has three pillars and I think Ginny will be talking a little bit more about patient-centred care in her talk. And certainly pillar one is about integrated patient-centred TB care and prevention. Pillar two is about bold policies and supportive systems. And this is where universal health coverage comes in. And pillar three is about intensified research and innovation, which of course we can use in the context of assessing universal health coverage. Now pillar two quite clearly outlines that we do need universal health coverage to end TB, that we are not going to achieve these very ambitious goals of the NTB strategy without the context and the backdrop, if you like, of universal health coverage. So you can see there in point C uh, under pillar two, universal health coverage policy, but also importantly point D, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, social protection, poverty alleviation, and action on the other determinants of TB. So breaking the trajectory of the TB epidemic, what is the current thinking about how that will be done? And what's the role of universal health coverage in breaking this trajectory? Well, actually, I'll just go back. <laughs> so, so just to explain that on the horizontal axis, we have years ranging from 2015 to 2035, so aligned to the NTB strategy. And on the vertical axis, we have the rate of TB per 100,000 population per year. And you can see the top line there. I'm not sure if I, you can see my pointer, but the current trajectory is that where the global trend is reducing by about 1.5 to 2% per year. Clearly not enough to reach this very ambitious goal that we have in 2035, which is down here. So the thinking is that currently we need to optimize the use 
of the tools that we have. And when I say tools, I mean um, perhaps the diagnostics, the drugs, but not only those things, the implementation of those as well, the models of care, how we care for patients, how we find patients, how we help them to stay in care. But that we do that in the context of pursuing universal health coverage and social protection. So those things cannot be done without pursuing that broader agenda of universal health coverage and social protection. And in that context, I think WHO is, is aiming for a 10% reduction per year to the year 2025. And this was achieved in some of the wealthier countries, if, if that's one way to call them, um, in the 1950s and 1960s. And these countries certainly had systems in place whereby they were pursuing universal health coverage. So it's thought that you know, this 10% reduction can be achieved within that context of universal health coverage, but also perhaps broader social and economic um, development. Now at 2025, um, it's thought that uh, at about that time we can introduce new tools, um, such as a vaccine, new drugs, shorter regimens, et cetera. But of course, all still in the context of pursuing universal health coverage, and that, that will help us have a faster decline in the rate of TB to get to those very ambitious 2035 goals. So even getting to the 2025 targets requires that we implement certain uh, uh, strategies and interventions, but all in the context of universal health coverage. But do we need to move beyond universal health coverage? I guess that's one question. Is universal health coverage alone sufficient to get to these ambitious goals? And a key indicator for universal health coverage is out-of-pocket costs for healthcare services. However, out-of-pocket costs are not are just one part of the financial burden, at least for TB patients, and I'm sure it's exactly the same for patients with NCDs. Non-medical costs and income losses can constitute a larger financial burden than some of the out-of-pocket costs, and therefore minimization of out-of-pocket costs, which is one of the goals of universal health coverage, is essential, but it may not be sufficient. So other interventions are needed to complement universal health coverage. And these are perhaps broader social and economic changes that can mitigate some of the other costs associated with TB and NCD care. So um, just to think about this concept of costs and, and where universal health coverage might come in, this is just a pie chart showing the costs incurred by TB patients. It's from a systematic review. Um, taken from low and middle income countries. And you can see that 50% of the costs are incurred before treatment even starts, and then about 50% after treatment starts. And about 25% or one quarter are these direct medical costs in blue, uh, about 20% are the direct non-medical costs. So these might be transport to get to the health center, accommodation to stay overnight if the healthcare center is a long way away but there are these huge income losses in red. So about 60% um, of TB patient costs are due to losing income. Now, universal health coverage will address this blue part, but universal health coverage may not address the green and red portion. So we could argue that in fact, we need universal health coverage, but we also need broader social and economic reforms. So one of the ideas is that, um, and this is certainly enshrined in the NTB strategy, is that we need to move towards having social protection for TB so that even when TB diagnosis and treatment are offered free of charge, these social protection measures may be needed to alleviate the burden of income loss and the non-medical costs of seeking TB care and then staying in that care. So some of these social protection interventions might be sickness insurance, disability pensions, social welfare payment, um, cash transfers, legislation that protects people from discrimination, such as being fired from the workplace, and then other instruments to protect and promote human rights, including addressing stigma and uh, addressing the needs of vulnerable groups. And there's a clear relationship between social protection and TB. So this graph shows social protection as a percentage of GDP on the horizontal axis and the prevalence of TB per 100,000 population on the vertical axis. So you can see that as social protection spending increases, the rate of TB decreases. 
So I'd encourage you, if you're interested in this idea of, of beyond UHC, there's a, a very interesting paper by uh, Knut Lundroth and colleagues on beyond UHC, so monitoring health and social protection coverage in the context of TB care and prevention. And they argue that we certainly do need universal health coverage and that that helps to minimise out-of-pocket health expenditure, it helps to reduce diagnostic delays, increase treatment uptake, etc. but that this can be complemented by social protection interventions and that both of these things will lead to a public health impact that you can see in the bottom box here. So reduced period of infectiousness, reduced infection and incidence, reduced prevalence, disability and rate of death. So I guess I've just had 10 minutes and I've tried to keep time to let the other speakers also have their time. So just to summarise, um, at least for TB, I think the ambitious goals of the NTB strategy can only really be achieved in the context of uh, universal health coverage and of countries moving towards that. However, um, we're not sure if that will be enough. Uh, we may need to move beyond universal health coverage and look at broader social um, interventions, such as social protection interventions. And I think we know that um, TB patients, in terms of the costs that they incur, uh, there are costs associated with income loss and indirect costs, which may not be all covered by universal health coverage. And that wider socioeconomic changes are also likely to reduce rates of TB and benefit societies more broadly. So um, I'll just say thank you. Uh, and before we hand over to the next speaker, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kerry Vinny, for sharing your expert remarks. Well, this is a perfect opportunity to listen to Ms. Ginny Williams for her invaluable experience. Ms. Williams, it's over to you now. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so um, do you want to... I haven't... Oh, there we go. Not sure what screen you're seeing. It. Are you seeing my screen? I see your screen. You can. Good. Okay. Well, thank you for for inviting me to come and talk on this. I think um, I'm a stand-in, really. To be honest, I have to confess um, because Dr. Carrie Tudor is now in charge of the ICN TB project. But I've worked with her for many years and um, I was largely responsible for the first edition but we've worked together on the second edition. So following on from um, Kerry Viney's presentation and that's a very good introduction to what I'm going to talk about today which is about the um, best practice for the care of patients with TB which is a guide which we developed with the Union, International Union Against TB and Lung Disease and mainly focuses on low-income countries but is adaptable to any setting. So as Kerry was saying, universal TB care is absolutely essential and this has to encompass preventive methods um, such as infection control and very quick diagnosis and full treatment um, as well as more active, you know, making sure you've got the right diagnostic tests, people have access to them, we have the right treatment, people can access them, access the treatment for the duration and also to have um, proper care and support throughout treatment. And Kerry's already mentioned the um, very ambitious goals we have, and sometimes it can feel like we're a little bit on the bridge to the, to the left without being too negative. But there are quite a few holes that need to be plugged in uh, reaching universal coverage, which we're aiming, which is more on the, on the right side, the, um, the bridge on the right to get people safely um, through treatment. And to achieve this, we need a lot more than just the clinical interventions um, and the patient support. We need a full strategy to support that. We need investment in every part of the strategy, um, as well as developing um, new diagnostics and treatments and trying to make things um, better and more and quicker. For people but we also need to focus on the implementation and that's really about um, how we care for patients and make make that make all those health interventions accessible to people and this takes investment uh, investment in 
all aspects, including um, the workforce, which is so essential because TB, especially as many other conditions, many other non-communicable diseases, all conditions require that personal touch, that rapport with the health service, the local understanding of what's required by people to, to be able to access their services um, following the principles of universal health coverage, um, that care can be accessed where it's needed at as low a cost as possible. And the quality of that care needs to be good, as we've heard. So we need to make sure that the workforce out there has the right knowledge and skills to be able to provide the care and to actually implement the tools that we have effectively. So a bit of history about the best practice guide. Um, the first edition was published in 2007, so it's been used extensively since then, especially by the International Council of Nurses, um, who's now trained over 25,000 um, nurses as trainers in 20 different countries. And the, the feedback has been, has been very good, and I'll go into that in a, in a bit of time. But the really unique thing about this guide is that it is absolutely embedded in current practice. So nurses who use this guide and other people working in, in TB and, and providing care directly to patients will recognise um, the very detailed step-by-step -step guidance which follows the patient from, the big, from before diagnosis to the completion of treatment. So every stage from the diagnostic phase through to supporting people in the um, first phase of treatment and then the second phase of treatment as they get more independent. Um, it, it gives you a very detailed um, breakdown of, of what needs to be done and what you need to do it um, and to, to be able to find out exactly where the issues are. So it's based in current best practice which means it is completely realistic and recognisable for people in the field and it translates the strategies that we have and the TB policies, policies into practice. It follows the patient, so the patient is the centre and the core of everything that's built around them, so at every stage of their journey through treatment they get the right, um, right support they need and the access to the, to, to the right information and the right uh, tools and interventions that they need to get them through diagnosis and then through to the end of treatment. And the way it sets out, which is a series of um, standards, um, enables you to actually look at, enables people to actually look in detail at everything they have in place yes. to see where their gaps are, yes? Sorry, Ms. Williams, would you be able to run your slide through? Because it seemed like your slide has frozen. Oh, well, I'm speaking on one slide. Okay, it's thank all, you. Can you see the slide? It's, it, I can see your slide, but uh, okay. Is it just the title slide or is it the... It seems seem like just the title slide with the best practice for the care of people with TB. Okay, so you don't, haven't you got the information? <laughs> I don't have it. No, well, I'm I'm looking at my my screen has got the right yes. slide that I'm talking to. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry about that. Can you see it? No. No. I can see you scrolling through something. Well, I've got <laughs> this is the slide I've got on my computer. Yes. All right. So you can I'm go sorry, ahead. I'll see the link. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Okay, you, you, you're doing well. <laughs> well, it's, it's just saying what I'm saying, so um, I'm hoping... Did you see the pictures of the bridges? No. No. Oh dear. So, I don't know what's happened. So, I'm sorry. Okay, you can go ahead. <laughs> okay. So we've had um, very positive feedback from the guide, from um, nurses using the guide in different ways. Um, in Kenya, um, the Eastern Deanery AIDS Relief Programme has used it for training nurses, community health workers, clinical officers, 
and cleaners for a huge um, 16 clinic based um, service in the eastern side of Nairobi. In Russia there's very good feedback from training nursing students um, and in Zimbabwe where we haven't done any training with the guide at all, people were just start, picked it up and started using it and have asked for more copies. Um, we've had good um, feedback from all different places where we've been using the guide. In Mozambique, um, nurses have referred to using the guides to solve specific problems. In Latvia, they've used it to evaluate and improve practice. Um, and in Zambia, um, nurses have reported that following the ICN training how useful it has been to have the guide to be able to train others. Oh God, I can't believe this. Sorry, are you... Um... So I'm trying to show you my next slide, I, but you can't see it, can you? I'm seeing the second slide is saying what's new in the second edition. Oh, that's my last. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes, that should be it. Can you see that now? Yes, what's new in the second edition? Oh, okay, 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 good. So in the second, right. Okay, I'm up now, am I? Yeah. So. I'm going to carry on. I want to just show you this first slide because this is what I was talking to. Did anybody see the slide to start with? Anyway. Okay, it's the first time I'm seeing it. Oh, it's the first time I'm seeing it. So what I was talking, so uh, what I was talking about was the fact that we need all of these aspects to be covered: prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and care, and that we probably, in order to to reach those ambitious goals that we that have been outlined in the NTB strategy. And for that, we need the whole strategy investment workforce and knowledge and skills. And that's what I've been talking about with the best practice guide. Um, that's what we've been doing. So what's new in the second edition? In the second edition, we've been working more closely with the union. It's been a collaborative um, publication between the ICN and the union. And it takes account of the NTB strategy, which has obviously come online since 2007. And it gives additional guidance at every stage of the patient's pathway on infection prevention and control, which was something that was missing in the first, first half. And this, this is it. So whether you're in the diagnostic phase or going to clinic or being cared for at home, all aspects of infection prevention and control are covered at the right um, stage in the pathway. And it also includes new content about the care of people um, with drug-resistant TB. So it, again, in as much detail as we were saying before, and again, um, based uh, completely on current good practice in places with very poor resources. So why is good quality care so important? I've got a quote here from Dr. Paula Fujiwara from the union. The guide is a crucial tool that is strengthening healthcare systems right at their heart. It's led by the patient's needs, and it's being used to empower the staff who work with TB patients every single day. And we really need to get to this very solid bridge where we've, as Kerry was saying, that we've got all of the, um, the diagnostic tools and the treatment tools that we need, but they're all firmly um, implemented and effectively implemented right at the lowest level, closest to the patients. And the best practice guide actually gives people the opportunity to take something they recognize and to translate it into their particular setting um, and to find out what's working, what's not working so well, and to really improve practice on the ground. And it's a very proven uh, method of, of working, which is, has been going now for over 10 years. And so I'm very delighted, I'm absolutely delighted that this is the second edition is about to be uh, launched today. So I just want to acknowledge Carrie, who may have been more familiar with the, uh, <laughs> with the media, uh, the current ICN project director, and you can get in touch with her at the ICN for further information. Um, and Dr. Paula Fujiwara, who's been very supportive in, in the second edition, 
and the whole writing team, which is uh, senior nurses from many different countries, as well as TB Alert, who continue to, to work so hard for patient-centred care in this country and in all their projects. So thank you very much for your time. I apologise for, I'm not quite sure what happened with the slides, but I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Ginny Williams. Before we open for Q&A session, let us listen to our final panelist today from a country that has the highest burden of TB, malnutrition and dealing with enormous disease burdens, India. Dr. Rajesh Kumar Sud. Dr. Sud has worked with National HIV Program as well as National TB Program and has used innovative ways to find solutions locally and make intersectoral collaboration work. Well, it's now over to Dr. Sud. Uh, thank you, moderators and the CNS team for inviting me. Uh, I'm a very small, humble grassroots person. Uh, well, I would like to begin with the good news from India that a universal health protection scheme, uh, a sort of an insurance scheme, has uh, been launched. And uh, our, one of our goals is to eliminate catastrophic expenditures on uh, due to TB. So uh, we hope that with the increased uptake of this uh, universal health insurance, uh, some of this uh, catastrophic expenditure could be taken care of. Another thing that's happening in TB uh, right now in India is that a lot of rapid transitions are happening. Uh, CBNET has been upscaled, universal DST has been started. Uh, we are having active case finding, which is uh, again a uh, step towards the universal health coverage. Because active case finding, we try to reach the unreached. But uh, in this whole process, hand holding is very critical. Uh, in all theoretical formulations, all uh, orders, or what you call communications, we presume that we have conveyed a message and it will get implemented. But actually, it doesn't happen. There are a lot of barriers, there are a lot of uh, resistance on the ground. Uh, I can share a very small example of a recent. Uh, initiative. Uh, see, people don't have access to the CB nets and uh, for this we started a sputum collection transport scheme with the help of an NGO. Uh, what happened was that after 15 days we took a stock and we found that sputums were not being transported. And what we found was that you need people to fill the lab request forms, you need people to pack the samples and the people were just not willing to do that. So having a person to transport didn't just solve the purpose. So strengthening of the health systems and the demotivated human resource, we need to invest them. Uh, I think Ginny uh, took up the issue of uh, having skilled HR and I will talk, talk further that motivated HR is critical. Uh, I think uh, all of us do understand that uh, TB and health are underfunded and uh, maybe staff uh, is underpaid which leads them to be demotivated. So a lot of hand holding is required and maybe we need to uh, what you call uh, further uh, strengthen the uh, what you call health systems uh, to make all the interventions towards universal health coverage uh, successful. Uh, another example that, can, that I can share is that uh, here we started a, a nutritional supplement for TB patients. Uh, again, we presume that uh, we are offering a very good product and everybody is going to accept it very gladly. We are giving it free. But uh, again, some issues came up that uh, it was sweet, so diabetics could not take it. Some people uh, thought that it's too hot for the body, the in Indian culture is a concept that hot food is cold food. So again the acceptance was limited. Uh, but the whole uh, issue revolves around the strengthening of the basic healthcare system. We try to develop a lot of innovation, a lot of conceptual frameworks, a lot of uh, things to uh, 
uh, uh, people uh, have a further uh, uh, cutting edge technologies, but unless the basic uh, framework of the health system is not addressed, and unless we are able to strengthen the health systems, uh, I don't think we are going to achieve much. So uh, this is uh, what you, what my experience from the field. Uh, and uh, another thing that I would like to share is that a uh, lot of partners, potential partners, if we are uh, able to extend to them, people are willing to chip in, people are willing to support, uh, like uh, uh, government systems, procurement systems are very, very cumbersome. To buy any small thing, you need to have a tender, you, uh, that takes a lot of time. Uh, usually you don't have that much time if you want to make a change. So one example I can quote was that uh, in the dot centers, uh, you need to have a water supply to ensure that you, uh, the patient can take a medicine. So one of my friends, uh, he donated water campers for all my designated microscopy centers. So a lot of, uh, there's a scope for uh, partnering with people to strengthen the universal health coverage, to strengthen the health systems. So I think uh, that's all I would like to share. And if any questions, uh, I would like to respond. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, Dr. Sood. Well, that brings us to the end of our experts presentation. Let us now begin the open session. Participants, please keep sending your questions using the chat function or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen. Open session begins now. It's now over to my colleague Rahul. Thank you so much, Shrug Bhai. Uh, well, uh, the open session begins now, and there are several questions which I have streamed in. So participants, please keep sending the questions as well. And uh, the questions which I have streamed in, two are from Myanmar, and one is from Ong C2. She asked that in developing countries, how shall we integrate the services of tuberculosis with other NCD and maternal and child health? Any reference or examples on resource mobilization for in terms of UHC? There is another uh, question on uh, from Myanmar from Thant Ong, and I see Thant Ong is online. Thant, will you like to ask your question yourself? Probably you are on uh, self mute. Can you unmute yourself, Thant from Myanmar? Okay, she has uh, so Thant Ong's uh, question is here. Uh, then Thant asks, how will UHC be implemented in a country with poor political commitment and poor financial coverage for health sector and poor health workforce? So there are two questions from Myanmar. Over to you, panelists. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Kerry. Yes. So the first one is, yeah, do you want me to read them again? Or? No, it's, it's Ginny here. Oh. Hi. Oh, hi, Ginny. Sorry. Yeah. Hi. I would just, I would just say, I think one of the one of the key things is for departments to work together because I think there is a real challenge between um, different silos of health systems being developed for different conditions. So, you know, we found out recently, well, we know, we've known for many years, but we that um, we need to work more closely with um, NCD services for TB. Because um, diabetes is linked, obviously HIV is linked, smoking, there's all sorts of different issues that cross cut. So it's really important that health strategy is is developed as a as a whole and not just in these different silos, which is complicated by the fact that you've got international donors um, f sending funding through different streams for different conditions. So there needs to be really a global effort to make this to make a, a much more collaborative effort to make sure that resources are shared better and actually they're used together to, to, to create a much stronger health service as a whole. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ginny. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to add that uh, uh, there was a big malaria summit that just happened in Myanmar where political leaders from Asia-Pacific countries were there and uh, uh, to take the progress further on uh, efforts for eliminating malaria by 2030. So, so let's hope the political commitment and financial questions are also 
uh, you know addressed there is uh, there are other questions which are streaming in and they are pretty uh, they're, they're around finances and uh, one is from golam farooq from bangladesh and golam has written that without sufficient budget allocation how is it possible to reduce uh, tuberculosis and ncd morbidity and mortality and a similar question uh, on a uh, uh, on a related line has been asked by Lord Vaseem Raza and I can see Lord Vaseem Raza is online. So Lord, will you like to ask uh, your question yourself? Lord Vaseem Raza. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I'm just uh, interested to know uh, because all uh, speakers talk about uh, universal health coverage, but where is the health financing, uh, where, where is the health financing component in it? whether the panel promotes tax-based public health system or a universal health insurance by, promoted by government or cooperative health societies or universal health insurance with the participation of private players and regulated by the government. Which system you are promoting to achieve the goals of universal health system, health coverage, sorry. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Lord Vaseem Raza. So over back to panelists, uh, which will we should be working better for in terms of public health uh, security, like tax-based public health system, universal health insurance by the government, or universal health insurance with participation of private player. Over to you, panelists. Uh, could I respond? Yes, please, Dr. Rajesh Sood. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I would like to share the ex uh, experience of India. We are here in Himachal, uh, this is a government administered scheme of universal health insurance and uh, the premium is as petty as 1 rupee per day, means 365 rupees per year and uh, with this uh, uh, the, there is no TPA, there is no insurance uh, involved, the government is directly administering the scheme and uh, all sorts of middlemen are uh, eliminated. The government is still spending on public health, the tax based uh, this thing, but this is to decrease the out of pocket expenditure. There are many gaps in the public health system, so uh, this is a sort of a adjunct to the uh, existing public health system. There can be more models, so I just, I'm just sharing the current uh, initiative here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajesh Sood. There is uh, another question from Zafar from Bangladesh again uh, and uh, the question is, is it because TB diagnostics and medicines are not available for free in private sector? Is that because why UHC for TB in public sector only is not working? Um, uh, perhaps he meant that uh, not resulting in TB decline as sharp as we, uh, we might uh, need to end TB by 2030. So, so TB services not being free in private sector. So is that an obstacle? So back to panelists. Kerry, Ginny, will anyone of you like to respond? Well, <laughs> um, I think that uh, most most national TB programs do try and make sure that TB services are free in the private sector, and there has been a big big effort over many years to involve um, the the private sector in a public private mix sort of model. Um, and I think this is the, the, the solution for, for both this and the other, the other question about what type of funding you need. It really does depend on the, the way that um, systems are funded in, in each country. Um, I don't think you could have a purely um, insurance-based system. Um, some of it has to be supported by tax because some people just will not be, will be outside that system and it's always the most vulnerable in society, or mostly the most vulnerable in society, um, who might not be um, signed up to a government scheme, who, who do get affected by things like TB. So it's a, it's a mixture. Yes, there has previously been a lot of evidence that there's been problems um, with people accessing care in the private sector, but that has actually improved with a lot of effort on public public private mixes and and actually a lot of the um, the tools the diagnostic tools and and the um, and the medication is, is provided uh, for patients but the additional costs may be more in the in the private sector so um, and it's very tricky where the private sector is seen as is more trustworthy maybe in some places than the, than the public 
um, sector. I do have to say at this point, as a plug for the best practice guide, is that because it's so locally um, achievable, that it actually does not cost very much to improve care. And this is what we've seen, is that with very, very little investment, just by providing the tools and actually motivating the staff and giving them the tools to make changes locally, you really can make um, very good improvements to services um, just by better skills and knowledge among the staff. So the problem has been that the investment, international investment, has mainly gone to developing the exciting stuff like new diagnostics and new tools and we're forgetting to really invest in the, in the people on the ground who are actually delivering the care. Very right comment. Uh, that was uh, Jeannie Williams and uh, another has come in from Dr. P. S. Sarma. He is one of the key organizing persons for the 72nd National Conference of uh, on Tuberculosis and Chest Diseases, which will begin on 15th of December in India. Dr. P. S. Sarma has said that all aspects of universal health coverage are being covered at NatCon 2017, which opens on 15th December. Example: newer diagnostics partnerships. And the theme of the conference is joined hands to NTB. The website is natcon2017.in. So participants do check it out. Uh, there's a related question which has streamed in uh, from Saad Rice. Uh, and uh, he says that, uh, uh, sorry, the screen is so small for, for the comments. So yeah, so he, the question is that, uh, thanks, Ginny, for your great presentation. Thanks, Kerry and Rajesh, too. Please share your insights how to ensure that UHC does not get limited only to medical coverage, but actually mm. expands to uh, broader health coverage, which uh, Ginny, Kerry, and Dr. Sood pointed out. So uh, over to you. It's a probably, it's a good question. Yeah. Mm. Um, if you like, I can take that question. Yeah. It's Kerry here. So, so yeah, that's a really inter interesting question. Um, and I think by medical, uh, I'm not sure if the person means inpatient care or, or services just provided by doctors. Um, but I, th I think, you know, the focus of UHC is on primary care. So, um, you know, health health care at the primary care level. So in the communities, outside of districts, at the lower levels of the healthcare system. And of course, a lot of that care, as Ginny has been talking about, is delivered not by medical professionals, it's delivered by nurses, sometimes even trained volunteers, um, village health support workers, whoever it is. So I think sort of enshrined in UHC is this also this emphasis on primary health care. Um, and just to get back to a former question, um, I'm not sure who asked the question, but it was about how will universal health coverage be implemented in a country with poor political commitment to universal health coverage? And I, I think that's that's very difficult because like anything, um, TB care, care for NCDs, um, you know, improving the quality of care or nursing training, whatever it is, you, you do need some level of political commitment. But I think one of the ways to get that commitment, if it's lacking, um, is to get some of the uh, civil society organisations or NGOs on side and to get some of those organisations to be allies, if you like, and to lobby their governments to do better. And we've done a little bit of that in Australia um, in an organisation that I'm involved with. And certainly it's raised the profile of TB in our region, not, not necessarily in Australia, but in Papua New Guinea, Indonesia and neighbouring countries. Um, but it's it's not been... It's been through, you know, civil society organisations writing constantly to our prime minister, writing to our foreign minister, and being very persistent in talking about this as something that's necessary. Thank you. Uh, that was Kerry Vinay. And uh, uh, there's another question on T, which is uh, related because diabetes came up earlier as well. Uh, the question is that TB diagnostics and drugs are free in government sector, but diabetes care is not. And uh, there's so much, so, so much linkages between TB diabetes. So how will we will make we will make UHC a reality? And will this not affect TB program outcomes too? I think the answer is obvious. If any of you would like to add a bit, uh, you're most welcome. 
uh, and uh, the time you people respond uh, there is a yeah dr sooth and dr sooth has also typed in a comment that linkage is a private sector to government facilities is important thank you for that comment dr sooth also the uh, program of officer for non communicable diseases so uh, what right now is uh, on the and will is that we are trying to ensure pre drugs and diagnostics for non communicable diseases also and very shortly i think uh, we'll be able to ensure the basic drugs and uh, uh, this diagnostics are free for all people uh, over here so i think uh, we are in the right direction and rightly pointed out that uh, unless we have a very good supply chain of free drugs and diagnostics the whole system won't work and the uh, next thing that i would like to comment is that linkages with the private sector are very critical a patient may go to a private sector but then he'll tell, tell the doctor that i can't afford this and if the doctor again refers the back the patient to us uh, let's see this is a poor patient please help him and we do get such types of referrals and uh, especially from my uh, uh, medical colleagues uh, who refer the patient for cbnet that this patient won't be able to afford in the market so why don't you do a free cbnet for them so this sort of linkage is also help in sort of uh, getting the proper services for the patient thank you dr sood last 4 uh, 5 minutes are left participants please keep sending in the questions uh, we will try to take as many as possible uh, uh, there is another question which's about catastrophic costs universal health protection insurance scheme is launched uh, as uh, one of the panelists said one of the goals is to eliminate catastrophic expenditure but uh, we, when has this been launched i think dr sood it is probably directed to you so uh, so the uh, uh, wants to know that when has this scheme been launched and uh, because tb patients often suffer even deeper levels of poverty during treatment the government of universal india health protection scheme sorry sir go ahead the government of india scheme uh, on health insurance and from a lot of recently in the last two or three months and uh, still people are being uh, just registering uh, people have to just online on the website and then they have to go to a a, a center where the biometric uh, uh, are taken measurements are taken and then the smart card is issued and with that smart card the person can avail that cashless uh, insurance for a limited uh, of 30000 per annum uh, for inpatient illness and uh, around uh, 175000 for critical area, uh, critical care in that includes uh, heart illnesses and all sorts of uh, uh, illnesses which are really very expensive it includes cancer and one of the good things with this is there are no exclusions no preconditions that you need to be disease free a person who's already having a disease he can also avail this insurance so it's a quite a good scheme from the customer point of view uh, i don't know whether from the what you call insurance point of view it may be considered as a good scheme or not but from a uh, beneficiary point of view it's a good thing thank you dr sood uh jini there is a question for you a very qu quick one uh, if if the guide is available in different languages um yes the guide the guide it will be not quite yet it's the first it's now being published in english but it will be translated into uh french spanish and russian for sure um the the first guide was in was also trans oh it will also be translated into mandarin chinese uh can yes mandarin chinese um so yes and it's possible to um talk to us about translating as well in different, different languages because we can always try and organize that because it it is a critical issue um the fact that these this information should be available in different different languages so do watch this space because it will become available in different languages and it the first edition already is available in, in quite a few different languages thank you so much jini thanks a lot uh, there's a uh, question from our staff correspondent uh, uh, rahul will you like to ask a question uh, hello uh, i'm rahul uh, cns special correspondent from india i would like to ask with the panelists uh, i think tv uh, had free diagnosis uh, and medicines in government hospitals for several years and despite evidence uh, tb preventive therapy is not available to the most uh, in need our uh, population at risk so do we need uh, intersectoral response for usc 
and what needs to happen so that uh, USC may mean to NTD. Yeah, OG. Okay, so TB preventive therapy, uh, particularly in India, has uh, just started being rolled out probably for people living with HIV. But uh, yeah, that's very true. We have a huge uh, latent tuberculosis uh, uh, incidence. Yeah. I think. Yeah. So over to you, panelists. Well, there's no doubt that that's necessary. So um, it's a big challenge. Yes. Mm -hmm. It is a, it Go ahead, is a Ginny. Go ahead, Ginny. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, it is. It is a big challenge. But yeah. in order to end TB, yes, absolutely, there needs to be an effort just as much for for preventive therapy as well, because without that, that will be a whole um, pool of new TB that will come along later down the line. So it really is essential that the the commitment is put in to 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 react to responding to that as well. Mm. And it might take some time if it's only just started. Um, right. in India, but I'm sure it will come on yeah. board. And... Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, Ginny. This is Kerry here. Um, and I think many countries struggle with the provision of preventive treatment. Um, so I, I don't think India is in any way alone. I think many countries struggle to provide it, to even record what they're doing. Uh, so it's a big challenge, I think, but I, I agree with Jenny that if we are serious about TB elimination, we need to address this massive reservoir, I guess, of latent TB infection um, that will reactivate at some point. And my, my understanding is that WHO are soon to release some new guidelines on um, prevention uh, and, and provision of preventive therapy in particular. I understand that they'll come out in the next two or three weeks. Oh, that's a great news, Kerry. We really look forward to that and uh, totally agree. And in Guadalajara at the union conference last uh, in October, uh, we we, we uh, read the new, you know, we saw the results of the first ever population based study, which showed uh, direct correlation between how diabetes increases uh, risk of latent tuberculosis. So definitely we need to, mm -hmm. uh, we need to do something about this pool and also provide universal access to other NCDs like diabetes, for example, if we want, if we are, if we are to NTB. Uh, because we are, uh, it's, the time is over and we are, uh, uh, we actually have two or three minutes above the time. So in case if any of the panelists want to make a final comment before we wrap up, anything, any parting message on the USC day? Small okay. Uh, well, uh, there's a place called Tiara, and the senior treatment supervisor of the RNTC staff, he was able to mot motivate the village level Asha. Asha is a great social health activist uh, under National Health System that screen all the childhood contacts for TB. So they used to escort the children to the pediatrician and uh, get them screened for TB. How I came to know was that there was a sudden surge of TB patients from one hospital and uh, when I uh, looked into the matter then I found that there is very good level of screening going on because one STS has been able to most motivate his team of ASHA and such innovations could be replicated and we are also trying to replicate such innovations. Wonderful, Dr. Sood. Asha, yeah. for those of you who are not familiar, are the grassroots workers uh, uh, doing amazing work, not just for tuberculosis, but also several other programs. We are, uh, we have uh, questions are pouring in from people, <laughs> uh, but we are really so sorry because we are above time. And uh, but thank you Can so I... much for the panelists. Yes, sorry, Jini. Yeah, go ahead. So I just want, I would just want to, to um, reinforce what Dr. Sood was saying because local solutions are will each, each one makes up a bigger picture and you know we have to do what's realistic at a local point and these these efforts which which match what's happening in the local community and the local community is so important to support the, the health mm. programs it's really essential so all this local work is really important to make up the bigger whole mm. yeah i agree yeah yeah Uh, anything, Kerry, you want to add? Or? No, well, no. I, just, I mean, I agree with Ginny wholeheartedly that we, we sometimes um, dismiss what we're doing locally as not important. Or, um, but, but I think, uh, you know, 
as I sort of said in my presentation, we have all the we have we have some tools. You know, we're always saying we don't have the best tools, and perhaps we don't. But that the challenge comes in knowing how to implement them in the context in which we live and work. I think. Um, so I, I yeah, I can just uh, sort of wholeheartedly agree with those comments, and and thank you for the invitation to the webinar and all the fantastic questions. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Kerry. And uh, best note to end this webinar that uh, change is going to happen at the local level and by, led by the people and communities. So all the best for the UHC day. Uh, we know, we have apologized for the slide issue, so we will share the slides <laughs> with Dr. Kerry Vinay and uh, Jeannie Williams as well. And uh, we will share the webinar recording, the podcast, uh, right after this webinar with all the participants and in the public domain. Thank you again, and uh, stay Thank tuned you. for the next webinar next year. Thank you. All the best Thank for the UHC day. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.